Hello and welcome back. In this video, I'm going to talk about working with mycelium on agar. I'm going to show and tell you the basics of agar and subculturing, why and when to do it, as well as cover some basic terms for new people. I'll be working with genetics I received from Green Table Gardens. I'll have a link to his channel in the description of the video. Green Table Gardens is another channel about mushroom cultivation. So if you haven't heard of Green Table Gardens, go check them out and show some love. If you're unfamiliar with agar, then this video is for you. Agar, once prepared, is a gelatinous substance like gelatin or jello, but it's made from a different source than gelatin. Agar comes from red algae, so it's vegan as well, as it comes from the cell walls of the algae. Agar is used as a media for working with spores and live cultures. I've said it before, but learning how to make and use your own agar can make all the difference between success and failure. If you're not using agar and you're experiencing failure, adding agar to your process can drastically increase the possibility for success. If the proper techniques are performed in a clean environment that's as close to sterile or aseptic as possible. If you have the ability and the space, I would highly recommend getting a fan filter unit. They come in various sizes and at various prices. A still air box is fine for most lab work. You don't have to get an FFU, but it should be on the list of things you need if you're planning on doing this for any extended period of time, as it will greatly increase your quality of life as far as lab work goes, as well as give you peace of mind that you're working in a clean environment. If they are well built and taken care of, along with having a pre-filter, FFUs are said to last about five to 10 years, depending on the usage. I got mine from Amazon for $427. It's a 22 by 22. It's a little bit small, but it does the job. If you have the money, I would get a bigger one that's two by three or two by four. That should provide all the space you need unless you plan on running a large operation in which case they make larger ones and you can always get multiple FFUs. Unless you are really crafty, I would recommend buying one that's already made versus trying to build one yourself. At the time of making this video, Dichotomous Keys on Facebook sells FFUs. I believe they are larger ones that are 2x3 or 2x4 and they start at $800. You can message him on Facebook and ask him if he has any available. He is a very nice guy, so he won't mind you messaging him. You can find them on Amazon, eBay, Etsy, and many other online retailers. Check the reviews and the ratings, as well as the size of the HEPA filter. It needs to be 0.3 microns or less for mushroom cultivation. Enough about FFUs, back to agar. Agar is a tool and a phase of the process that is mushroom cultivation. We use agar to germinate spores, expand and preserve live genetics, clone genetics, test culture and spores for contamination, share live genetics as well as isolating monocultures and monocarions. A monocarion is a single spore isolation. I'm going to be working with T0 plates in this video. T0 means these are the original plates that spores were germinated on. These plates usually have many different cultures or expressions on them. When you inoculate your agar with spores, they will germinate after some time and mycelium will begin to grow from the spore. One single germinated spore is known as a monocarion. When the mycelium from two spores meet, they can mate. If they mate, this is known as a dicarion. We are trying to grow mushrooms, so we want spores that mate because monocarions don't fruit or make mushrooms if they are cubensis. The spores only mate one time, so everywhere you put spores on the plate, there are likely many different matings occurring. This will usually result in many separate cultures going on the plate. With the T0 plate, you basically have two options to proceed. You can spawn the T0 plate to grain and run all the cultures on the plate. This is typically what's called pheno hunting. If you're trying to find a different looking mushroom, for example, an albino mushroom, a leucistic mushroom, a squat, or short thick mushroom or any variation besides the normal expression. This is how you would do it. The downside to this is all the different cultures will be competing for nutrition and it can result in poor yield and uneven flushes. So you can sort of give up yield to get something different. It's dependent on the genetics and will vary on a case by case basis. Sometimes these plates can actually perform well. The other downside is there could be contamination hidden somewhere under the mycelium or in it, which brings us to the second option, subculturing. 
Spores are notorious for being contaminated, and that's why it's important to start them on agar. Subculturing is just taking a small sample of mycelium from a culture and isolating it on a new plate or away from anywhere where spores are germinating or another culture is. We would usually let this plate grow out and inspect the mycelium for contamination and variation. Even though we separated the sample from the rest of the cultures, it's possible there are still more than two spores or one culture, even in the tiny piece. This new plate is called the T1 plate for transfer one or first transfer. When the T1 plate grows out, you might notice sectoring. It will look like sections of mycelium. You have to look close, but the mycelium will be slightly different. Maybe it goes a different way or it's thicker or thinner. It could be tomentose or rhizomorphic. There will be a faint, barely noticeable border. If you notice this, it usually means there are separate cultures. So what people usually do is take another sample or subculture from this plate and make a new plate. And this new plate will be called T2 because it's the second subculture. When you do subcultures, there is an optimal place to take the sample from. It's called the leading edge. The leading edge of growth that is furthest from the start of the culture or inoculation point. So it's the edge that is furthest from the center of the culture. This is supposed to be the newest, most vigorous growth. You don't have to use only the leading edge. Any edge will do but just try not to get any culture in with it if you're trying to reduce the amount of cultures competing with each other. Also, if contamination is present, you should take the sample from the opposite side of the plate. There are various ways to subculture. The most common way is with a scalpel. If you're still looking for a scalpel, they're available on Amazon and are fairly cheap. When you buy a handle, it usually comes with blades. I would recommend a number seven handle as it's very long and will help keep you from contaminating the plate and other things you're working on by keeping your hand further away from your work. Number seven handles are the longest. They're all different shape and size of blades. The standard is usually a number 11 blade. Blades are usually pretty cheap, just make sure they go with your handle. You can use tweezers to subculture as well. You really only need a very small strand of mycelium to start a new culture. If you use tweezers and are making small subcultures with it, it's important that the tweezers cool off completely after you heat sterilize them. Dealing with such a small amount of culture, it will be very easy to burn and kill it with the tweezers if they're still too hot. Otherwise, like with the scalpel, you just grab some mycelium and transfer it to a new plate. If you're going to run one culture per plate, it is best to put the subculture right in the middle of the new plate so it has the most space in each direction to grow. You can run multiple cultures on one plate if you're trying to be efficient and save resources. As long as none of the cultures are contaminated and they don't touch, you can run four cultures on one 90 millimeter plate. I usually do this when I'm low on plates. Make sure to label the plate correctly. Put a line on the rim of the top and bottom petri dishes so you know how the labels line up. Make sure to stay on top of these plates. If you have different cultures you want to keep separate, they could grow around each other. They won't breed with each other if they are dicarions, but it could cause issues if you get multiple cultures mixed up together because of the competition for resources. When you first start working with mycelium on agar, it can be hard to tell what you're looking at. Our mycelium has two basic looks. Tomentos and rhizomorphic. Tomentos means wool or cotton-like. It's usually fluffy and can be very thick. It looks like someone took some cotton and stuck it in the agar. Rhizomorphic is rope-like. It usually looks like thin ropes going across the agar. It looks like cotton that has been stretched and spun into a thin rope. Both of these are perfectly fine. One isn't better than the other. Rhizomorphic is usually preferred because it looks great in pictures and because you know it's the correct mycelium. There are various other fungus that can make tomentos mycelium. So there can be some cases where you might think you have cubensis mycelium, but it might be a contaminant. Cubensis mycelium is usually symmetrical. It grows deliberately in all directions from the center of the culture or the inoculation point, the mycelium should grow straight out to the edge. Contaminants will usually have random and sporadic mycelium that grows randomly in all directions. Cubensis mycelium usually grows flat on agar. It can get thick and lumpy sometimes with tomentos mycelium, but it shouldn't grow up as fast as it grows out. 
If you have multiple cultures on one plate when they meet, it should just create a faint border. The culture should be able to be distinguishable from the rest. If metabolites show up or one overtakes the other, one is probably contamination. Metabolites are produced by the mycelium when it is stressed. It doesn't always mean it's contaminated, but you should definitely pay attention to wherever it's produced. Metabolites are usually yellowish or amberish clear liquid. If you get any, it will stick out. You can't miss it. Most contaminants will have darker or more gray mycelium. It could be green, orange, red, pink, and just about every other color except white. Some will start as one color, and when they sporulate, they will change to a different color. Trichoderma, for example, starts as white mycelium and turns into green once it starts producing spores. When trichoderma is still white, it is usually whiter and more bright than cubensis mycelium. And if you ever see them together, the trichoderma mycelium will usually be very white. Once you see it for the first time in person, you won't forget it. Trichoderma mycelium usually forms in larger areas than cubensis and moves a lot faster. So if you inoculate a plate today and the mycelium fully colonizes the plate in a couple days, that's usually a sign that it's a contaminant. From germination, cubensis spores will take about a week or longer to completely colonize a whole plate. So colonization speed is another way to judge whether or not you're working with a clean cube culture or a contaminant. After other fungus and molds, you might run into different contaminants. Bacteria. Bacteria usually present as blotch or gooey blobs. Typically, they form perfect little circles that get larger and larger. If you use a swab that's contaminated with bacteria, the bacteria will appear in the same pattern you wipe the plate with. If you run the swab straight across the plate, there will be some goo that forms where you rub the swab. This shouldn't be confused with slime. Slime is usually a fungus. It's usually more clear and thinner than bacteria. The most common two are red and orange colored or white colored. From my experience, the red-orange bacteria usually comes from improper technique like hovering your hand over the plate or tools over the plate. Some bacteria falls off your hand or tools and gets in the plate. White bacteria usually comes from swabbing dirty mushrooms or swabbing them too late like after they've started to turn blue. These aren't the only ones you can get and are not the only way you can get bacteria in your grow, but in most cases, bacteria comes from not working in aseptic conditions or improper technique. Lastly, you might run into yeast. Yeast can be a cream, brown, beige, or even slightly yellowish. Yeast usually comes from media or substrate, agar and grain that hasn't been properly sterilized. But it can come from you as well. Like bacteria, it can be everywhere, so it can fall off your skin while hovering over a plate or from off a tool that wasn't properly sterilized. Contamination could easily have its own video. There are many different types of fungus and bacteria you will eventually run into. If you get contamination in a plate, you need to go back over everything you did. Did you sterilize the media long enough? Were you working in aseptic conditions? Did you sterilize your tools properly as well as wash your hands and sanitize them and the gloves? And lastly, there's always the possibility that the spores or the culture that you're working with was originally contaminated to begin with. If you're working in a still air box, bacteria contamination is usually more prevalent. Working in a fan filter unit or flow hood reduces the chance of bacteria, but it doesn't completely eliminate the possibility. Bacteria, yeast, and spores are more likely to be blown away by the clean air that's blowing. That's why FFUs and flow hoods are usually a lot more forgiving with improper technique. With a still air box, the air is typically still, so anything that falls off your hands or tools will fall straight down into the plate. Almost anything that falls into plate will grow. That's why it's so important to perform procedures with precise accuracy. Don't mess around and keep plates uncovered for too long. Once you have done your work, you want to close the plate immediately. It's best to not completely remove the lid, but rather just raise it slightly, just enough to get your scalpel or whatever tool in there and get out quickly. Make sure not to bump into anything with your tools and try not to set them down after they are sterile. Try not to rub the tool against the plate. Try not to touch anything except what you're subculturing, and this will help reduce the contamination rate. Likewise, you shouldn't talk or have your mouth open while doing lab work. There's all kinds of bacteria in your saliva, and when some people talk or breathe, they eject spit droplets that can get in your plates 
and grains and on your tools. When working with plates, people usually use the concept of a clock to identify locations on the plate. For example, if you're looking at your plate, the top is 12 o'clock, the bottom is 6 o'clock, and the sides are 3 and 9, respectively. Just like the face of a clock. So when someone says, I'd take a transfer from 6 o'clock, they're referring to the section of the bottom of the plate that would represent 6 o'clock on the face of a clock. When selecting mycelium for subculture, you want mycelium that is uniform in color and shape. Try to avoid anything that isn't white or doesn't have a consistent texture or look to it. Make sure it isn't scaly or powdery. All of our mycelium is cotton-like and should appear to be fibrous or filamentous. You will get a feel for it over time. It becomes somewhat of an intuition. This isn't everything there is to know about working with agar, but everything I could think of at the point that I made this video. There's tons more information and all kinds of variation and technique and tools. I would encourage you to seek out more information as well as reading any anecdotes available online. Everyone's situation, lab, and environment is different. What works for one person might not work for someone else in their specific situation. Also, just to be clear, I'm not an expert or an actual mycologist. This is all just stuff I have learned along the way that I'm trying to teach to others. One of the best ways to retain information after you learn it is to teach it to someone else. So this whole thing is a win-win for me because I get to help people and reinforce what I've learned by teaching. As always, thanks for watching everyone and thanks to those who are subscribed. Thanks for the like and the comments. I really do appreciate it. If you have any questions or anything to add, feel free to leave them in the comments below.